Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Matthew Kahn. Matthew is a Provo professor of economics at University of Southern California. He has written 11 books, and today we will speak about his latest book, Going Remote, how the flexible work economy can improve our life and our cities. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So Matthew, this is a, a moment in our history in which we had to do all of us the experiment of working from home. I mean, not all of us, but the great majority had to experiment with that. In, and it was an abrupt, uh, uh, drastic change from one moment to the other. There was no no uh, a time period to test the water. So uh, this is an amazing subject to talk about. But before we talk about it, I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your background. I see that you have been working in uh, urbanic, uh, urban economics and I'm just interested to know how is it that you got involved in that? It's wonderful to join you. I am an economist, my wife is an economist, and my son is now studying economics at our University of Chicago. I love it, I love and, it. And back when I was a young man, my teachers, Gary Becker, Jim Heckman, Sherwin Rosen, they emphasized that, that through the lens of microeconomics, we can understand so much of the world. I chose to take what they taught me and to focus on urban and environmental economics. And so I've been fascinated by Let's take the city of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, a city whose golden goose was steel. In the 1950s and 60s, Pittsburgh boomed as a steel town. Middle class people had jobs, but it was very polluted. Pittsburgh declined in the 70s and 80s as a capital of, st of steel production, and that led to unemployment for middle class people, but the air got better. And so I'm very interested in the ups and downs of city quality of life. And the COVID shock of 2020 was quite a shock to all of us, but it was a shock to people and places. And so it created a unique laboratory for me to think about, as you alluded to, the experience good effect of work from home and my book is a little bit of science fiction. It's sort of set like five years from now of what will our life be like in a world where many of, of us, many privileged people who are college educated will have the opportunity on a regular basis to work from home of how this will affect our quality of life, our cities and our firms. And so I'm eager to talk about all of this. Well, so you just say that uh, econom economists understand the world better than everybody else. The thing is that not everybody else wants to understand the world. And you speak uh, mostly, uh, you speak a lot in your book about transportation and how to uh, go, how to utilize the time better in order to create less traffic, for example, and that there will be more utility for that transportation time. And if you say something like, okay, we have to pay a toll for high traffic period, okay, then there will be all kinds of organizations complaining that this is going to affect the most, uh, the most uh, vulnerable people. And then there will be so much pushback that even though you understand the world better, it doesn't mean that the thing that you understand will go into effect. And I, I bet that's frustrating for an economist. So... I, I respect your point very much. I Economists have learned to be a little more modest. Um, what, what I love about being an economist is that it helps me to anticipate intended and unintended consequences. I, as I get older, I'm getting more modest about the predictive power of economics. You raised a key issue of the political economy. Many of us are stuck in traffic, but, but Cities like Los Angeles have been slow to introduce road pricing, and you raised the key issue of why. It is my hope that we've seen in Singapore and Stockholm cities experimenting with road pricing, and it's my hope that if work from home sticks, that many workers won't be on the roads at rush hour, and that there might be a willingness to take a new look as we be, as more people have a flexibility of not being trapped in traffic, of that there might be a willingness to experiment with policies uh, such as dynamic pricing. And with the rise of Uber pool and ride sharing, 
there is an increased ability for middle class people to use algorithms to go to the same place. If we could have four people in a car, they could share the congestion charge. And so that's an acute example of economic logic of how to price the externality while not pricing out the middle class and poor from having access to our roads. Because you are right that, that economists often run into this issue of the policies we want to introduce, whether it's carbon pricing or road pricing, can lower the incomes of lower income people. And they're going to oppose these rules if they feel that it's there's a negative income effect. You're absolutely right. Another hot issue that comes uh, often is the dynamic um, uh, price for parking. So I, I see it as the idea of pricing, a price would be a price high enough that there will always be at least one parking space available. And, you know, and then whenever there's no demand, uh, the prices could go down, but then there's all kind of people, I mean, all kind of revolt against that kind of idea. No, you know, the price should be whatever, X dollars per hour, no matter what time of the day it is. And that creates congestion <laughs> and, and we lose a lot of time. And sometimes personally, I had gone to a place and I had to come back because I couldn't find parking. <laughs> So for, I agree with you, for eight years, I taught at UCLA and Donald Shoup was my friend and colleague who did his great work on the high cost of free parking. Mm -hmm. And so imagine an economy where more of us can work from home and thus are not commuting on a daily basis. If we have a rise in automated vehicles that basically never park, and if we have more work from home workers, I think more land in cities would not be devoted to parking. That land could be turned into public parks. It could be turned into wetlands for flood control. So I think a very important idea that's it's sort of synergistic between what you were saying is if we can shave peak commutes, and with the commute, you got to park your car where you're going. But if you don't make that commute, Or if, you, or if you just rely on automated vehicles or ride sharing, American cities and Canada cities would need less parking and that land could be used to build more housing, more parks, more wetland. And so I think a reimagination of parking in cities, and I'm a fan of your point of pricing parking. I, I do want dynamic pricing for parking and for roads. And, and then I think the negative externality from cars would decline. So I like your logic very much. I would conveniently argue that the rise of work from home will help to get us closer to that political equilibrium because more people will have flexibility in their schedules. Okay, so Matthew, at what moment in your life you decided that you had to write this book going remote? Was it at the beginning of the <laughs> pandemic or you had something already in the cars uh, before the pandemic uh, arrived? So Ed Glazer of Harvard with a guy named Jess Gasper wrote a very important paper 25 years ago where they asked whether the internet would make cities stronger or weaker. Some people had argued that uh, that that we that the internet would be a substitute for cities, that people could just move to, to Montana and do their own thing and use the internet. And Glazer and Gasper argued that the internet makes cities stronger because you make contacts with people and you can stay in touch with them by email and by phone. And so it, so face-to-face -face contact and the internet actually go hand in hand. So with that in the back of my mind, when the COVID shock of 2020 occurred, I want to tell you three stories from my family. My son returned home from the University of Chicago and was very disappointed that he didn't have friend-to-friend, face-to-face interaction because of the virus risk. My parents in their 80s happily work from home. They're lucky to have each other. They're working in their early 80s, and they were very happy to work from home that this protected them as senior citizens. My wife and I, as privileged professors, were able to do our job. And so young people were very frustrated by work from home. They want to start their life face-to-face -face in cities. My wife and I, and, and so to answer your question, with My own experience with my own life, seeing my son's life unfold during the crisis, and with my parents' life, I began to think about the demographics of how different urbanites were, were able to adapt to the COVID shock in different ways because of access to work from home. And that was the beginning of my thinking through the new economic geography introduced by work from home. Okay, and how about businesses? How are they adapting? I know that here in Montreal, our mayor 
was offering free parking spaces in downtown, uh, downtown because the traffic just died and, uh, and the people who, who whose life depended on, on this food traffic, they, they were complaining. Well, now they have high taxes, high rent and no traffic at all. So, I mean, obviously they suffer, but I'm sure there are other businesses who they are saving tons of money by having their workforce paying their rent for them. So this is a very important question. In my book, and I'd be interested to hear your views on this, a point that urban economists emphasize is every city is a place of production and a place of consumption. So Pittsburgh in the 1950s was an important place for producing steel, but it was so polluted, it was not a great place to have an outdoor dinner. So something I want your listeners to think about is cities as consumer cities. From If I could advise the Montreal mayor, what I would want to say to her or him is, the future of Montreal, given that it's going to continue to be cold, um, Montreal's future hinges on having great quality of life because people will live in the city if they love living there, if the garbage is picked up, if the schools are good, if the streets are safe, if there's social tolerance across different groups, if there's social capital between groups. So my short answer to your question is cities, the, the consumer city element having good opera, having good sports teams, having great restaurants, that type of unique consumer experience, I think is gonna be even more important going forward for the mayor to be comfortable that he or she has an anchored tax base. Right. Uh as people are beginning to work from home, more and more people are moving to uh, small rural towns. And, and, you know, that may be pleasant to all of a sudden uh, wake up without traffic and, 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 uh, and breathe cleaner air. But at the same time, this is bringing up the real estate prices in these communities that never had to pay or compete uh, for for the price of a home and, and uh, there is a lot of upheaval of, as in regards to housing affordability in these places that never saw competition before. So this is a very important point. Uh, Bozeman, Montana is an example. So Bozeman, Montana has always been a popular destination. It's near some of America's national parks in, in Montana. But a debate is going on, as you said, in each of these towns on whether to welcome, are these the barbarians at the gate? Do you want to welcome these, it, almost like that Billy, that, that, that movie, uh, so I'm forgetting the movie City Slickers, of when these urbanites moved out to, to the country, B Billy, uh, and something I talk about in the book is that every small town is going to have to think about its zoning and housing supply. Many rural places are zoned for agriculture. Will they upzone to allow people to build houses on a half acre lot? So will we, in the language of real estate economics, will there be an elastic supply curve? So as you were saying, if it's very difficult for real estate developers to build, then growing rising local demand will translate into huge increases in home prices and renters in the area can be priced out of their own neighborhoods. And we both know there'd be a backlash against that. So the sweet spot would be if there's towns in America that want to get younger, and if they welcome, want to welcome people who will move in, because that will raise the tax base and improve the local public schools. I think it remains an open question, which American communities will welcome growth and the tax revenue and the new blood that brings in. Because in, a, in many American, in many US, rural areas, the areas have been getting older and have been becoming depopulated. So work from home could bring in people who have cultural roots for the place and an affinity for the amenities of the area, mountains, skiing. Uh, and, and so parts of the US that have lost people, the Appalachian region could have import more people because of the rise of work from home. I agree with you, each community is going to have to wrestle with this issue of whether they welcome these new individuals or if they want to build local walls to say, no, no, please don't move here. Right. I have heard also of several cities as well paying cash bonuses for people to move in. They want this workforce that uh, don't is not a big burden on their cities and at the same time they are they they pay uh, nice property tax dollars and it seems to be a, a work from home um, 
population seems to be higher educated with nicer jobs. And it seems to me that many cities, they would like to have this kind of citizenship in, in their, within their walls. So you nailed it. When I teach my urban economic students, I talk about the usual of marginal versus average. If the average person in one's jurisdiction makes $32,000 a year, and if the new entrants make $84,000 a year, marginals above average, and the, the argument you made plays out that the on average, the area gets richer if the entrants are richer than the incumbents. And so a point my book makes is America, the United States is a highly diverse nation. And you've sketched out the two sides of the coin of some communities that won't welcome entrance and other communities that will. I think that with the internet and Twitter, people will know. A point I make in the book is if Matthew knows that he doesn't know whether I'll be welcomed in a community, I can rent there for a year versus buying a property and see if I like it there and see if I'm welcomed by the church, by the local people. And so there's ways to rent on Airbnb for a year and run this as an experiment. And if it, if it doesn't work, if they don't like bald, plump guys like me, I'll say, you know, no problem. I'm going to go to another area. And only a foolish person would purchase a $400,000 house in an area they've never lived in before and say, whoa, these folks don't like me. Um, and so in the language of economics, there's an option value here to rent in one of these communities for, if I'm a work from home worker, to rent for a year to see if we're a good fit. And if it is, God bless. But if it isn't, I'm going to move on and try somewhere else. Right. I'm, I'm also seeing other trends such as uh, people from California and New York uh, moving to Florida. And even Elon Musk uh, uh, decided to leave California, goodbye, California, and your taxes and regulation, and I'm going to Texas now. So in the book, I talk about this, and I'd be interested in hearing your opinion. Um, as an economist, a famous economist named Charles Tibu talked about voting with your feet, that if, if your children aren't getting a good education in the city of Los Angeles, you can move to the suburbs. If Elon Musk is angry with his trillion dollar tax bill in California, that he could move to Texas. The ability to vote with your feet means that local governors and mayors have to do a better job providing high quality services per tax dollar because people work from home workers are more mobile and just as you sketched out will vote with their feet and migrate away from an area that doesn't meet their needs so something i talk about in my book is an unintended consequence of the persistence of work from home is I think we're going to get better local governance because cities won't have a monopoly on their tax base. And if a Montreal doesn't do a good job providing services per tax dollar collected, Canadians there are going to move out and move somewhere else. And that this spatial competition is actually very healthy. Um, I'm a fan of competition that it will local officials will have an incentive to be more cost effective in providing local public services. Okay, well, we tend to think when it comes to economics and, uh, and many of these issues, we tend to think within the framework of the United States, but hear me out. So uh, a worker decides to go from New York to Texas, let's say, but that same worker could go from New York to Mexico. Now, uh, this person is paying even less taxes and maybe a nicer uh, uh, climate, but if a company says, okay, my employee is working in Mexico, why shouldn't I just hire Mexicans and pay half of, half of the labor? So I wonder how is this going to play out in organizations? Are they going to have a global workforce as opposed to a United States workforce, assuming people are equally qualified and, and, and can do the work, whether they are in New York or in Tijuana? This is a brilliant question. In one of the middle chapters of the book, I talk about Richard Baldwin's work on offshoring, where he asks a very similar question as you did. I want to give two answers, and your question is brilliant, and I only half know the answer. In cases where, I want to make two points, and I want to make them quickly. In cases where firms still need to have monthly face-to-face -face communication, they might prefer to have US workers because they're closer to the mothership. If the job can be completely outsourced and offshored, you're absolutely right. Elaine, I'm a fan of competition. And 
Mexico and other middle-income countries will be strengthened if U.S. jobs are offshored. I, I continue to be a fan of globalization. And so if per dollar spent on labor, if Mexico has better workers than the U.S., God bless. I, and and, and I, I support this. I recognize that this poses a wage challenge to U.S. workers. And I mentioned in the book that if we observe an offshoring of many work-from-home jobs, this provides an impetus that U.S. workers need to raise their game in acquiring more skill. So again, I'm a fan of competition. And, but you've raised a key issue that work from home is not a free lunch for American workers. For those jobs that can be done remotely, why do political boundaries matter? And again, my short answer there is if some jobs like working for Amazon require monthly face-to-face -face interaction, could a, could a worker who has to jump over an international visa boundary do that easily? Uh, but your question is essential. And, and, and again, as a believer in competition, I think it's very important for workers to face competition, that they'll continue to invest in their skills if they face international competition. I face international competition as a professor, um, and, and, and NBA basketball players face this competition. So there's an interesting question in a competitive system. Um, how much competition do we want to expose individuals to? And how do people respond to competition? Do they raise their game or do they get angry and try to erect walls to keep out potential competitors from Mexico and other countries? Right. Uh, no, well, um, you mentioned that your son was not, uh, un, uh, was not happy because the lack of social interaction. And there's another group of people who is not happy, which are uh, single mothers. Now they have been adversely affected by this working from home because the infrastructure to take care of their little kids while they have Zoom meetings and I don't know, whatever other work duties they have while taking care of a three-year-old kid is just, and unfortunately that responsibility continues falling upon the woman, even though we men are totally capable of taking care of a three-year-old girl, but it, it continues being, the burden continues being taken by the woman. So I, I, I don't know what would be a, a reasonable solution for that. You raise a very important point about the chore wars. I want to say, two reasonably smart points. My book is set like five years from now where fingers crossed, I hope that COVID is behind us. And that raises the question of, so we're, you're absolutely right, is the gains to single female mothers from work from home will be larger if we have higher quality childcare And if, if there's almost like, a, so Uber provides a temporary workers to drive you. If we have high quality childcare through what is what would be an equivalent of Uber, more women could gain from work from home. A, a more sophisticated point I want to make from chapter two in my book is if men are commuting less because they're only going to work two days a week, they will have this windfall of extra time. And I would hope that same-sex couples and male-female couples, men will have fewer excuses if, because if they're not doing these monster commutes, there's a household bargaining game over chores. Will men take some of the extra time they now have because they're not commuting to do the chores in the house and to be better fathers? And so um, do you believe that at all? So there's a question with the time windfall that commuters will now have gain if their commutes decline by 50%, will they bear more of the household role because they have no excuses? Right. Uh, another uh, question that comes to mind is the fertility rate. I mean, the fertility rate in most industrialized countries is already low. And I wonder if working from home and staying from home will either increase or decrease that fertility rate. I mean, you have your exposed next to you all day long, but at the same time, now you have to take care of those kids uh, <laughs> most of the time. So you get to see the real consequences of your actions, a uh, real life. <laughs> wonder what you take there will be an increase or decrease in the fertility rate so i cite one paper in the book and i'd like to hear your impression that a, a prediction from urban economics is if people if work from home eligible workers don't have to go to work five days a week they can live further from where they work and home prices are cheaper the further you move out away from job centers when home prices decline 
people purchase a larger home. And so there's been papers in economics that have found that people have more children when they live in a larger house. Yeah. And so to, to put this logic together, if Matthew is a work from home eligible worker, and if I move further out from New York City or San Francisco into the distant suburbs where land is cheap, if I have a bigger home, I have more bedrooms, and this might lead me to have more children, Children are time intensive. My wife and I only have one child and we chose to, to be a, a power couple. And so there's a question of um, even, even though as professors, we work from home, I don't think we would have had a second child given our goals. But if you believe this housing story, those who live in a larger home, that this has a causal effect on increasing fertility. But I, I love your question. I think it's ambiguous. Okay, and one last question. This one is in regard to your son and to the future hundreds of thousands of people whose who, uh, social life, when they are so young, has become such an important part of their personality. I, I, I have nieces right now that didn't have the experience of going or are, are being deprived of the experience of going to college with a cute boy or going to, I don't know, whatever party was I used to go to. So uh, I wonder if that would be more rare and, and how will people like your son will adapt to this working from home future? It is my hope and I have the same question as you. As I think about cities, I expect that core cities, whether it's Montreal, New York City, Baltimore, are going to get younger. I think in a post-COVID world, I think that established people like me, many will decentralize. And with the durable housing in cities like Montreal and Baltimore, I actually think that there could be lower rents as commercial office towers. Some will be converted into residential housing. Where I absolutely agree with you is young people need face-to-face -face interaction. They want to fall in love. They want to experience life. And they're tired of Zoom. Um, Zoom has been pretty good for me. I had the opportunity to meet you. Uh, I'm an established guy and people just say, Matt, let's Zoom. But young people wanting to learn about life, to learn about what they're good at, to, to experience different things, you need to do that face to face. And so I'm an eternal optimist. I hope for your niece and for my son that the challenge they faced before COVID is cities like New York City and San Francisco were really expensive. We weren't building enough housing in those places and demand was sky high. If some upper middle class guys like me no longer demand to live in these cities, that creates openings for young people to, in sort of a game of musical chairs. So I agree with you that cities have bright futures as places where young people are going to concentrate to enjoy the consumer city and meet each other. And older guys like me will occasionally go for those similar experiences. But we owe it to our young people because of their fundamental need for face-to-face -face interaction. I believe that's going to be the driving force for why center cities will continue to thrive, even though work from home opens up such possibilities for established middle-aged and older people. Right. Uh, Matthew, I wonder if there's any, I mean, I have gone to your book uh, and I agree with almost everything, but I wonder if there's any question that I neglected to ask you. So I actually wanted to ask you a question about Canada. For, um, I have visited many parts of Canada, uh, from Calgary to Toronto to Montreal to Vancouver. Do you have any surprising or uh, uh, any predictions of a part of Canada that could thrive because of the rise of work from home? Of so, uh, so uh, are there places near national parks that have been slow to become cities? Um, I, I, I do not mention Canada in my book. If, if, if I get the chance to revise the book and have a chapter on Canada, any themes that you would recommend? Well, I, I'm, not ex I'm not sure of the exact percentage, but I, I understand that almost 75% of the Canadian population live very close to the border with the United States because it's the most southern part of, of the country. We have a country that is bigger than the United States itself, but uh, in population, we are no bigger than California. And almost everybody else live, like I live in Montreal, I'm only two hours from New York state and, and they are, commerce, most of the commerce is on the border, all the cities, Vancouver, uh, Toronto, uh, you name it, all of them are 
close to the border. In fact, many parts of Canada are more to the south than many cities in the United States, believe it or not. <laughs> so that's that. And then because there is such a concentration to the border, in spite of our country being so huge, housing is extremely expensive. Uh, housing in, in Vancouver is expensive. Housing in Toronto is as expensive as housing in New York. So uh, I, I hope that this working from home will spread people out a little bit more and housing will become more affordable. Canada is a very attractive place to live. The government and the security that that I have seen here is without comparison. In my city in Montreal, a, I don't know, a young girl can walk down the street in da downtown uh, very sexy and no one will ever even say anything to her. So people can work around here with so much security and peace of mind. So it, it's, a, it's a beautiful country, uh, but housing is still out of the reach for most young people. And I think this working from home dynamics will change that and more, let's say middle age of older people will move out out of the city and, and it will create an, an opportunity for younger people. I agree with that. And I think it's very important. So a point that I want your listeners to think about many, um, when I teach economics at USC, I come across as a big fan of markets. Many of my students are highly skeptical that they will benefit from free markets. And you just made a very important point about the American dream and the Canadian dream. And are young people optimistic about their future in the face of climate change, world turmoil in Russia and the Ukraine, the COVID virus? I think it's very important for young people's mental health to be optimistic without while well, being realistic about the future. And if work from home can create new opportunities for middle-class people, for new immigrants to Canada and the United States, then I think that's very important because I'm very worried about the young cynicism and, and they make very good arguments when they debate me. And, but I very much hope that, it, that truthfully that their future is bright. And I do think that work from home will play a productive role for just the reasons you said of creating new opportunities for people who aren't part of the 1%. You and I are not worried about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos' children of, of, of what becomes of everybody else and what opportunities do they have. Another trend that I'm seeing, especially here in big cities, is uh, people are putting a smaller emphasis on, on vehicles. Uh, so, for example, Uber, uh, because of Uber, there are many new condominiums that don't have inside parking because many people they, they but they do have a designated and i say uber but uh, it could be the the many of all of these ride sharing um, uh, platforms they have an special uh, uh, a segment for pick up and drop off and they don't have uh, um, indoor parking so this they decide to use that space to build a few extra units and that's amazing uh, public transportation is getting better at least here in montreal and 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 also our mayor here have made a, a great emphasis on uh, cycling roads, which is something that I begin to see in many other cities as well, uh, a priority for cycling. And these new uh, electric bicycles are also creating a train in transportation. A lot of people who didn't have the physical ability to, to pedal in a real bike, now they get an electric bike and they can go 20, 30, 40 minutes without breaking a sweat. I love it. I'm half an environmental economist. And remember, I was telling that Pittsburgh story. I'm fascinated whether it's in China or in Pittsburgh or in Canada or in LA, as air quality improves in cities of our using our time. What's your conception of the good life, of living a new urbanist life where you use a bicycle, you walk? If there's lower crime in cities, we're willing to live in closer proximity with strangers. If there's trust, people of different income groups and races will be willing to live in close proximity. So I think it's very exciting to have a green city future 
we're, where we use public parks, we use public transit, uh, that's partially tied to trust in low crime. There isn't a direct link there to work from home, but if our cities are safe and clean, that opens up many possibilities for each of us to pursue our own conception of the good life. Uh, Matthew, I just noticed uh, in one of the questions that I had here for uh, for you, I forgot to ask you, uh, how is uh, working from home benefit uh, equality? This is a very important question. My book editor, your question is very important, and I have wrestled with this, and here's my answer. My book editor turned to me in the middle of my project and said, Matt, we like your book, but this is an elitist book because the people who are able to work from home tend to be the highly educated. Uh, and you keep celebrating the benefits for them. What about everybody else? I tried to expand the argument in the book, and I think in Canada and the United States, we need to discuss this. I argue that if work from home workers begin to move to areas um, far from the cities, they will need services. They, uh, these services can be many different jobs, uh, a job, many different jobs in the household, in the community, and this will create service jobs for those perhaps who aren't eligible to be work from home workers. So an example, if Matthew is a guy who works at a local restaurant, uh, either cooking there or cleaning, if I love to ski, if a work from home community gets formed in a ski community, I can now get employment there and engage in more in my favorite leisure activity. So something I want your listeners thinking about is if enough work from home workers decentralize and, and spend their time and money in a new location, this creates a new service economy in a place with cheaper rents. And that's an example of how and everybody else can benefit from the new economic geography of work from home workers. Matthew, I wonder if you could tell us one more time the title of the book and where can the listeners follow the work that you're doing? Thank you. So my book is called Going Remote, How the Flexible Work Economy Can Improve Our Lives in Our Cities, and it will be published by the University of California Press in late April 2022. And I'm an economist at the University of Southern California, and I'm eager to talk uh, to, to, to scholars like you, to, to speak to, to companies who are wrestling with how to integrate work from home into their business arrangements to attract and retain talent. And you made a great point. You mentioned that there's mayors thinking about how to use work from home, whether it's having WeWork or other places for work from home workers to cluster for them to meet while they independently do their jobs. I think there's new opportunities for smaller cities and for even new cities in Canada and the United States to make the most of work from home. Because a the theme I talk about in chapter one of the book is the United States had We, our superstar cities had too much of a lock on economic activity. The superstars were in New York, Boston, San Francisco, San Jose and Los Angeles, and a little bit in Chicago and Miami. I claim that with the rise of work from home, with our diverse preferences for how we live our lives and our family roots, that America is going to spread out. There's going to be a bigger geography of economic opportunity. And you mentioned that Canada, Vancouver, has a major housing affordability challenge. If the Canadian people spread out to different cities, that will empower the middle class and make them less pessimistic about their future. And the old cliche about the American dream, uh, I believe the American dream and the Canadian dream are reinforced if home prices stop If housing becomes more affordable for more of us, we'll be less cynical in our daily life. And I think that that would be very good for our politics. And so, so I'm overselling the causal effects of work from home, but I believe my story, but I will let my readers debate it. I believe it too, Matthew. I wonder where can people follow the work that you're doing? Do you have a website or are you so, social so media? On, so on Twitter, but nobody, I, mean, I have 7,000 followers on Twitter. I'm MattCon1966 on Twitter. And I have good discussions with folks. I am a fan of free market economics, being an old University of Chicago economist. And that tends to anger other people on Twitter, but I am open to friendly debates and discussions. Um, I'm well aware that free markets help the 1%. But I also believe if configured right, and you made a number of points related to road pricing and dynamic pricing of how do we unleash free markets to help the middle class and the poor. 
And I think that that is the debate going forward. And so I'd love to have more discussion, more polite discussions on Twitter at MattCod1966. But thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, they do say that free markets is the less worse system there is. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much for your time. This was great. Thank you very much.